Good morning and welcome to the 32nd meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2019. I can remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices to silence for the duration of the meeting. Item one is a decision on taking business in private uh, and that will be the discussion. Uh, Again, item five in private, are members content to do so? Thank you. Um, our next agenda item is an evidence session with John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary for Ed Education and Skills, on the 2019 exam diet, standardised assessments and subject choices. And can I welcome two committees this morning, Cabinet Secretary, also Graham Logan, Director of Learning, and Julie Anderson, Head of Senior Phase Unit, Director for Learning at the Scottish Government. And can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a few opening remarks um, before moving to questions from the committee. Good morning, Kavir. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to make an opening statement in relation to the three topics that the committee has requested to discuss today on the Scottish National Standardised Assessments, the 2019 Exam Diet and the Senior Phase Curriculum. On standardised assessments, I'm happy to provide an update on the progress that we've made in taking forward the recommendations in the committee's report, as well as those of the Independent Review of P1 Assessments and the P1 Practitioner Forum. In August, we provided schools, local authorities and other stakeholders with a clear and definitive statement on the purpose and the use of primary one standardised assessments. This was a central recommendation in a number of the reports. Work is well underway with key stakeholders on the development of a practical framework on the use of data and enhanced communication materials. I'm happy to discuss the full range of activity we are taking forward in more detail, if that would be helpful. I welcome the review of the P1 assessments and the thorough and detailed report by David Reedy. I welcome Mr Reedy's conclusion that P1 assessments had valuable potential and should be continued. I also welcome the recommendations he made for improvements to the assessments and, as I have said, that work is well underway for completion. On the 2019 exam diet, there was, this was a strong set of exam results with three quarters of candidates attaining a pass at higher grades A to C and over a quarter of candidates achieving a grade A at higher. 28.3% uh, in 2019, uh, compared to 28.4% in 2018. We have seen an increase in entries and pass rates across National 5, including a rise in passes for English. At higher level, there was an overall fall in pass rates, but if the exam uh, pass rate only ever went up, people would rightly question the credibility of our system. And we have always acknowledged that in a highly performing education system, there will be fluctuations from year to year. It is also important to highlight the broad range of successes beyond national qualifications. Since 2014, rates of attainment in awards have been increasing, with a 38.1% increase in the number of Level 5 awards and a 26.5% increase in the number of Level 6 awards. We have also seen a sizeable increase in national progression awards, many of which are taken at school. The reality is that our young people are achieving a breadth of awards, giving them the best chance of success in further learning, life and work with over 54,000 skills-based qualifications achieved in 2019, more than double the figure attained in 2012. Um, as the committee is aware, following publication of the 2019 SQA results, I commissioned my officials to work with national partners to conduct further analysis. From this analysis, I have asked partners to carry out further collaborative work to ensure there is alignment of the curriculum and assessment journey from S1 to S6, and to consider how we can better support professional learning and development. Uh, lastly, convener, on the senior phase curriculum, the committee's report on the senior phase inquiry has provided a range of perspective, which, alongside other national evidence, has been helpful in informing further work in this area. In order to better understand the issues emerging from this evidence, it is important that we draw on the broadest possible range of evidence and data in a systematic and considered approach. That is why the Government has commissioned an independent review of our senior phase. The purpose of the review will be to explore further how Curriculum for Excellence is being implemented for young people in S4 to S6 across the country and to identify any improvements that might be made. We are mindful of the need for stability in the system after several years of change and uh, the national qualifications are therefore not the focus of the review. It is appropriate that the leadership of the review comes from out with the system that is why we have asked the OECD to provide this. The OECD has agreed to lead the review, which will, be, which will follow on from the very successful review it conducted of the broad general education within Curriculum for Excellence in 2015. It is also important that we have close involvement from the education sector, 
in line with the empowerment of the teaching profession, education practitioners will work alongside the OECD team. This will be led by a local authority director of education, who has now been confirmed by the Association of Directors of Education. The review will explore many of the themes emerging through the committee inquiry around the senior phase curriculum offer across S4 to S6, the impact of curriculum design decisions at local authority at school level, and the impact of approaches to learning and teaching. The review will start in December, and I would expect an interim report in June, with a final report in August 2020. We are currently developing the terms of reference for this, and I wrote to the committee on the 8th of November seeking its views on the broad parameters of this uh, review. We will be working on this with our local and national partners through the Curriculum and Assessment Board, who will be meeting next week. In all of this work, we need to be mindful of the original aspirations of CFE and of the actual experience of young people learning in our schools. One of those core principles of CFE is personalisation and choice. This means identifying and planning for opportunities for personal achievement in a range of different contexts. This implies taking an interest in learners as individuals with their own talents and interests. We can therefore expect a greater variety of pathways and course choices to emerge for this to look different in different localities as teachers work with partners to meet the personal choices, needs and aspirations of young people. In my view, we need to listen to teachers and schools who I believe are delivering this and the other key principles of CFE successfully. And I look forward to discussing these issues with the committee this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, could I just explain that some of the members may have to depart to move stage two amendments during the course of the morning. So just to explain why people may leave. I, um, but I will now move to Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, convener. Can I put on the record that I'm one of these people who will um, have to depart probably around uh, quarter to 11. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I would like to ask some questions about the uh, 2019 diet of SQA exams. Before I do that, could I just ask you a question uh, as to how you respond to what was the committee's unanimous review in a report that, and I quote, we have very serious concerns that there is a lack of clarity within Scottish education about who has responsibility for curricular structure and subject availability. Well, I think it's important that that question is addressed because I think the, the, the thinking behind Curriculum for Excellence uh, in its original design provides the answer to the, 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 the fair question that is posed by the committee. Essentially, in terms of the roles and responsibilities within the education system, um, I am ultimately responsible for education policy in Scotland and for the um, design of the curriculum as agreed by a variety of partners within education, but ultimately I carry the responsibility for that. Uh, one of the points that was accepted fundamentally in the design of Curriculum for Excellence was that there would be variability in the curricular design models that were adopted at local level. And I think if you look back through the records of the work of the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board and the various stages in the long design of Curriculum for Excellence, that principle was acknowledged and accepted that there would not be a uniform um, mechanism in place. What there has to be, however, is there has to be confidence that each curricular model um, is appropriate and effective to meet the needs of young people and to fulfil the aspirations of Curriculum for Excellence. So in that, res in that respect, curricular design is a fundamental part of inspection. Uh, so Education Scotland will be looking very closely and carefully at the way in which uh, the curriculum is designed at local level. Um, the committee will be familiar with the argument that I have advanced that a necessary uh, element of ensuring that the curricular model that we have adopted in Scotland can be successfully delivered uh, requires there to be empowerment at school level to enable schools to decide on the curricular model that they will take forward. And in some circumstances, uh, schools will collaborate on that design with other local authority, uh, with other schools uh, under a particular local authority to try to maximise the availability of educational opportunity for young people. So I have in my mind for that some of the um, uh, what are called um, shared campus models where schools will timetable on a consistent basis so that they can offer, particularly within the senior phase, 
uh, the uh, broadest range of subjects possible for young people uh, to choose from. And that may involve, for some young people, travelling from one school to another to maximise their curricular choice. So the, the, the answer to the committee's inquiry and to the point that Lewis Smith makes to me is that ultimately I'm responsible for curricular design and education policy. But that will be, um, the operational decisions about that will be taken at local level. And Education Scotland, through their inspection work, will evaluate and assess the effectiveness of the curricular choices that are made at local level. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, th the quote that I read out was a unanimous view of this committee. And uh, do you accept that parents uh, have a right to be concerned when this committee is saying categorically that there is concern about the where the responsibilities lie for curriculum uh, structure? Does that concern you? Obviously, I want parents to be satisfied about the quality of education and the delivery of education. Of course, I want that to be the case. And uh, in a sense, that, you know, that is the, the most direct um, area of interaction between parents um, and schools about the curriculum. Um, I would expect schools to be deeply engaged with their pupil and parental community on convincing those communities about the effectiveness of the curricular model that has been taken forward. So, so just, just to be absolutely clear, Cabinet Secretary, is, are you concerned that this committee has uh, thrown up um, some criticism about the main agencies within Scotland about their, what their responsibilities are and who is accountable uh, to them for certain decisions that are made about exams or are made about the actual curricular structure? D does that not concern you? Well, there's obviously, if there's criticism of national bodies or criticism of me or of the government, I want to address that, which is what I'm trying to do in the answers that I'm giving to, to Liz Smith. But fundamentally, the discussion that Liz Smith raised with me there, the issue of parental satisfaction and contentment, mm. and part of what you know, my answer to that, and the most important part of my answer, is I want parents to be satisfied at local level in the curricular choices that have been made by their schools. And they must have the opportunity to be engaged in discussion with schools about those particular curricular choices, because fundamentally that's what matters to parents. Mm. It's not, um, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's more important for parents to be satisfied in the curricular choices that have been made about their own children and young people, um, as opposed to parents being satisfied that you know, Education Scotland is, um, is, is devoid of criticism about its role. I think the most important judgment that parents will be concerned about is what's the educational experience of my child and am I satisfied that that's meeting their needs? And in that respect, um, I think different choices will be made in different parts of the country. And that's one of the, that comes back to the very first answer I gave Lewis Smith, that under Curriculum for Excellence, there is not a prescribed uniform model around the country. Now, Parliament could judge that there should be a, a prescribed uniform model around the country, but I would think that runs contrary to the thinking that Parliament signed up to about Curriculum for Excellence, which relies fundamentally on the professional judgment of the teaching profession, which will be demonstrated in the decisions that are taken at local level, which is why I put such an emphasis upon empowerment within the teaching profession. So um, I want to make sure that parents are satisfied by the quality and the effectiveness of the education of their children. And the model that is adopted to do that will vary at local level, school by school. I think that's, I think that's perfectly acceptable. But what we have to be satisfied about is that when those models are assessed and considered by Education Scotland, there is a rigorous assessment of whether those models are successfully delivering cu curriculum for excellence and successfully meeting the educational needs of children and young people. Uh, thank, thank you for that uh, long answer. Um, uh, th the bottom line here, Cabinet Secretary, is that in, in the summer, we saw the fourth consecutive fall in higher passes. And that is very much something that concerns parents, and not least because the Scottish Government has described the higher pass um, uh, as the gold standard in Scottish education. C could you uh, tell us, please, exactly why you think there has been that four consecutive years uh, of the downturn, what you're doing to address it, 
and whether you agree with your own officials who warned you that this was a very serious problem. The, the, the first thing is I think that we've got to, you know, we've got to look carefully at the numbers on the, the, the pass rate. And broadly, for three years, the pass rate was around about 77%. And it was marginal difference, uh, around about 77%. And the pass rate has fallen by two percentage points to 75% in the 2019 diet. Now, I still consider, as I said at the time, and I maintain today, that a pass rate of 75% is still evidence of a very strong performance by young people within Scotland. Um, the fact that three out of four candidates are passing their higher examination um, and that we have such strength at A to C grade is, um, in my view, uh, a very strong indication of that performance. Um, now, I... As Liz Smith will know, and as I said in my opening statement, I have in, you know, interacted and interrogated those results uh, very closely with um, Education Scotland, with the Association of Directors of Education, with the SQA and with my own officials to identify the issues that we need to uh, address in relation to the uh, performance uh, at higher level. And what I think that what that throws up, um, first of all, is the, um, the strength of the performance, as I have said, but it also shows the necessity to ensure that we have a, a clear focus on enhancing learning and teaching at all times within our education system. That's why we have a national improvement framework, because we must have a system that is constantly focusing on improvement within the education system. Um, and fundamentally, that will be delivered by enhancements to learning and teaching. So we are taking a number of steps, as we do in relation to any examination diet, to make sure that standards are clearly understood across the education system. So the SQA is making sure that standards and expectations of the education system, sorry, that the standards that the SQA expects are clearly understood by the education system. Education Scotland, working with local authorities and the regional improvement collaboratives, are putting in place the, um, the necessary measures to ensure that we are enhancing learning and teaching at local level. And that was why uh, we took the decision to establish regional improvement collaboratives to make sure that we had available uh, those opportunities to invest in the enhancement of learning and teaching. And we are also um, working uh, to ensure that uh, there is the access for schools who feel there is a necessity to, um, to address particular challenges they may face uh, to be able to, 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 to have access to the support networks that are available to do all of that. Now, the final point I would make in relation to, to this question is in relation to the, the, the whole question of performance within the exam system and what you know, the, the variability that takes place. In 2018, there was a fall in the pass rate in National 5. In 2019, there was an increase in the pass rate at National 5. And I simply state that to illustrate the volatility that can take place in a system in which our young people are performing at a very high level in their attainment. And I think that's an important point to remember in the analysis of the 2019 exam diet. Well, five was, uh, was much improved. But the, the central point here is, Mr Swinney, your own officials were very concerned about the four-year downturn in the hire. Uh, very concerned about it, because they, they specifically flagged that up to you. Um, what, what I want to know is why, why they are so concerned, on, on, as in what, what are the factors behind that fall, and what are you doing to address that concern? Because it is supposed to be Scotland's gold standard. Um, and just in relation to what you said um, er earlier about um, the relationship that you have with the different education agencies, you know, what, what are they doing? What are they doing and as instructed by you to address this problem? Because that's not just a, a, a an annual variation. That's four years of decline. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm at risk of repeating some of what I've already said in my answer. Um, no, because no. what um, the point I made to Liz Smith is that I think we've got to look very carefully at the numbers. And I think the way that Liz Smith characterises those four years is, in my view, 
um, not an, an appropriate... Do your officials flag that up as a, as a major concern? Well, what, what, I, what I'm saying to Liz Smith is that if we look at the pass rate, the pass rate was broadly around about 77% for three years. It has gone down to 75% which I recognise is, 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 a, is a decline. Uh, I've acknowledged that. And, but we have to look at that within the context of it still being a very strong performance by young people in our education system. Now, what we have, you know, in, in the light of the discussions that I've taken forward with um, the various organisations involved in the delivery of education, um, we have uh, looked at making sure that schools have access to uh, support to enhance learning and teaching because fundamentally learning and teaching is at the core of, the, uh, of what drives the performance in examinations uh, and that will comprise a range of different interventions and uh, availability of support from Education Scotland, from the Association of Directors of Education and from the SQA in making sure there's an understanding of standards to make sure there is an understanding of the curriculum and the expectations that will be within the curriculum and to provide the, necess the necessary support uh, to schools to enable them to deliver the best possible outcomes for young people. Uh, my final point, uh, are you implying, Cabinet Secretary, that there isn't sufficiently good understanding of what these standards should be? Uh, I, I'm saying that we have to make sure in, 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 the, in the collection of different things that we have to do as a system, we have to make sure that there is the, um, it's, that's one of the elements we have to make sure about, that there is an understanding of what the standards are expected. If we go back through the education system, when I became the education secretary, I, uh, I asked the chief inspector of education to put in place clear benchmarks of what we envisaged about the levels to be achieved at early level, first, second and third level within the broad general education because I wanted to be satisfied that the system knew what was expected of it. The same applies in the senior phase. So it's vital, and it's part of the ongoing work of the SQA, um, who do a, 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 an extensive amount every year uh, with the system to make sure there is a clear understanding of standards within the education system. Um, so that's got to be done habitually. There has also got to be investment in learning and teaching and enhancing learning and teaching, which is precisely what I envisage would be the role for regional improvement collaboratives, working with local authorities to make sure that schools were effectively supported to meet the expectations of the education system. Thank you. Uh, Ms Mackay. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm fortunate to, lo to live in a, or to have a constituency with very high achieving schools and um, record um, exam passes almost every year. But we know that the, um, there are geographical areas of concern and that's long been the case. Um, would you agree with me that things like regional collaborative uh, improvements and PEF uh, funding, which, which, which are obviously um, geared to trying to, to, to close the gap, it's, it's almost like the start of a journey and, and it's going to take longer for us to see that um, the improvement that maybe some people are expecting to see just just too soon because there's a whole range of packages that you've described that that um, are, are geared up to do that. I think there are, there are a number of issues that we have to look at in, on, on this question. The first of all is the importance of having a focus within our education system persistently on improvement. And um, it's interesting that um, even in some of our um, high-performing schools, um, there is a constant focus on improvement, on improvement, or the improvement necessary to enhance learning and teaching. So even though those schools, and I recognise in Mackay's constituency, there are a number of um, very high-performing schools, um, they are all looking at how can they do more and how can they uh, do better. And that culture, I think, is now deeply embedded within the education system because I see schools looking to the components of the National Improvement Framework to identify how they can progress uh, as individual schools. The second element is that there are particular challenges in that journey. And I acknowledge, the government acknowledges, the particular challenge that faces young people who come from a background that is influenced by deprivation, <coughs> which is why we put in place the Scottish Attainment Challenge and Pupil Equity Funding to try to put in place resources and additional support 
to maximise the effectiveness of, um, the, of, of school performance. And I think we are seeing the, the signs of that journey. It's going to be a, it's going to be a challenging journey because there are deeply embedded uh, uh, issues and challenges within our society. And um, we, we have to ensure that we build on, on the progress that's been made uh, with sustained investment, which I believe we have put in place uh, for the attainment challenge. Um, the International Council of Education Advisors, in their last um, input to me, made it clear how important it was that we remained consistent on that journey to close the attainment gap, but that also we recognised that this would be a series of, of relatively small incremental gains as we make progress over time. And I think that's an important reflection to bear in mind. And then lastly, I think in any analysis of, of these points, we have to take the broadest analysis of what is actually being achieved by our young people within schools. Um, not all of that is captured in, on SQA results day. Um, it is for some schools, but not for all schools. And when we look at the, the broader data that's available through the insight analysis, which captures all of the school performance at different SCQ, Scottish Credit and Qualification Framework levels, we see uh, improvements in performance year on year because young people are um, involved in uh, pursuing qualifications and learning that's not all under the umbrella of the Scottish Qualifications Authority, which is the exams diet that Liz Smith was asking me about a moment ago. So, for example, at SCQF level five, by the end of S5, in 2016, we saw 85.3% um, of young people achieving one or more awards. That rose to 86.2% in 2019. And at five or more awards, that rose from 55.6% of young people to 59.6% of young people. So my point is that we have to look at the broadest range of analysis of performance not just the SQ exam diet, which doesn't tell us the whole story, however important the SQ results are. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Coldruth. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I just want to pick up on Rona Mackay's line of questioning, and I guess with regard to Liz Smith as well, um, in terms of exam passes, we obviously can't just narrowly look at exam passes as a measure of whether or not a school is good, um, and you've spoken there about that wider range of opportunities available to young people. And I wonder, um, perhaps, if part of the decrease in, in higher passes, and it is, it's not a huge percentage dip, um, I wonder if it might be linked to more people having the opportunity to set higher passes, uh, higher qualifications rather than might have been in the past. So schools that I've taught in in the past have put a block on certain pupils from obtaining that qualification based on their academic um, ability. And I wonder if perhaps there's been a cultural shift to encourage more pupils to experience that qualification. Well, the, 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 uh, undoubtedly, the composition of our schools is changing because more and more young people are staying on to the end of S6 or, or, or for longer than was the case in the past. So we have a, a sharp rise in the proportion of young people that are staying on uh, in school. When we look at, um, you know, I, I cited there in my answer to Rona Mackay, um, the level five achievements in the uh, in the insight analysis. If we look at the level six analysis, which is the, the higher level, um, uh, at the end of S5, the proportion of young people who are achieving an SCQF level six qualification rose from 18.8% in 2016 to 22.1% in 2019. Now that's looking at a broader range of uh, qualifications than just the SQA exam diet, which I think represents one of the elements of Curriculum for Excellence which was always sought after, which was to ensure there was a broader range of qualifications that young people had access to. So I think that data rather demonstrates that broadening of achievement that is being undertaken, uh, and also the fact that young people are pursuing a curriculum which it better addresses their interests and their aspirations than perhaps only following a more limited uh, curricular approach which might be captured by the SQA national qualifications. So I think it's important to, to look at that breadth of experience and achievement as part of this process.
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Miss Wisher. Thank you, Convener, but my point's actually already been answered. Um, well, thank, thank you. you. Um, Mr Johnson. Thank you. Um, so I'd just like to ask a, a, a few questions about SSNA. Um, uh, so, and in particular, in its conclusions, the committee uh, expressed concern that there seemed to have been a shift in uh, the uh, focus of SSNA from being uh, one of national performance data to one of uh, assessment at school and classroom level. And indeed, uh, the EIS's written submission uh, contained a, a rather stark statement saying that there was essentially no value at a national policy level in terms of what SSNA is delivering. I'm just wondering uh, how Mr Sweeney responds to that statement by the EIS and whether it's correct or not. I think there's a... Um, I would accept that the purpose of, SN, uh, of Scottish National Standardised Assessments um, was not as clear as it could have been, which is why I've taken steps as part of the measures that we've taken forward to address the purpose of uh, SNSAs. And the purpose of them is to contribute towards the judgment of teachers on the performance of young people as they progress through the different levels of the broad general education. Now, that is important information because prior to the introduction of SNSAs, we did not have across the country um, a method of assessment that gave us consistency of judgment across the system. So. We, we didn't have benchmarks of what we expected young people to achieve at uh, individual levels. So I put in place those benchmarks so that the teaching profession were much clearer about what was expected of them at early level, first level, second and third level. Um, we then also had to put in um, a mechanism which would help in the moderation of standards across the country which is what SNSAs were designed to help teachers to formulate that judgment about. And all that flows into the, um, the judgments that teachers make about the performance of young people, which are reported annually. And uh, that information will, in fact, be published a week on Tuesday on the 10th of December, the, um, the achievement of levels data at each of the levels that I've cited. And the publication of that data in December um, will no longer carry the label of experimental statistics. Uh, the chief statistician has uh, decided that the quality of the data is now at such a level that the experimental uh, data status needs to be removed uh, for, or can be removed from that data. And, uh, the, uh, and that obviously gives much greater confidence in the data that will be produced in December. So the, um, I, I would accept the point that we needed to clarify what was the purpose of SNSAs. Um, I think we have done that. I think the EIS statement to the committee, um, its most recent statement to the committee, acknowledges the progress that has been made in clarifying the purpose of Scottish national standardised assessments. And I think that puts us in a strong position to support young people um, to address any challenges they face in their education through the broad general education. So I, I, I accept much of, of what you say about the, the need to, to provide kind of a consistent uh, uh, you know, uh, means of, of uh, assessing uh, and indeed uh, giving tools to teachers to see whether or not their uh, uh, pupils are achieving uh, the standards we expect. But, but in, in the government's own submission in response to the committee's conclusions uh, that you state that on their own uh, they cannot provide summative assessment or whether a learner has achieved the curriculum for excellence level relevant to his or her age. So I'm just very slightly confused as to what, based on what you've just said, uh, Mr Swinney, in contrast with the written submission that the government has provided us. I, I, what, 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 am, am, am I right to be confused, or could you explain? I, 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 hope, I hope not, uh, Mr Johnson. Um, the, 
ultimately, the, the, the data that's published a week on Tuesday um, will be the judgment by teachers around the country of the um, ability of young people to achieve particular levels in the broad general education, early level, first level, second and third level. So that data will, is informed, is driven by teacher judgment. That teacher judgment is informed by a multiplicity of educational experiences that young people will undertake during the year. And one part of that will be the Scottish National Standardised Assessments. So the Scottish National Standardised Assessments are not, um, they are not defining the teacher judgment at the end of the year, but they are part of the evidence base that teachers will draw upon to determine whether or not a young person has got command of a particular level. And that level, uh, that the command of that level will be reported um, in the annual information that's published a week on Tuesday. And uh, as I indicated in my earlier answer, um, that data will no longer carry the experimental uh, statistics, the ex experimental statistical classification um, that has been removed by the chief statistician. So what we need to be clear on is, is precisely what what that will be telling us. And what that will be telling us is, is a, essentially a, a summation of teacher judgment. What, what, what it won't be is, uh, it won't have the, the consistency that SSLN did as a, as a, a consistently applied test. And, and importantly, the other key thing that I think SSLN gave us, which the SNSAs will not, is the contextual information. Indeed, uh, and again, in our written submissions, it was, it was pointed out, uh, that the, the, the SSLN uh, had a, a, a variety of uh, elements to it, looking at uh, teaching practices and pupil attitudes, which provided a context to, to the attainment and achievement mm -hmm. which it found. It, it, do, you, do you accept that that's a weakness uh, of SNSA in comparison to the old SSLN? No, because the, the, S, the, the SSLN was a survey um, which gave a limited extract of information about the performance of the education system uh, as, you know, as a whole, globally, across the country. What it didn't give us was information on the performance of young people through the education system. And fundamentally, that's the issue that matters for me, because what I'm concerned about is to make sure that every young person is able to be supported in their learner journey to fulfil their potential. So the data that we now have on teacher judgment gives us information across all of the pupils at that particular stage in the, their learner journey um, about whether or not they have command of that level of their education, which we expect uh, by the end of P1 for uh, young children uh, to have command of the early level um, and then to progress through the education system. So it gives us a much more comprehensive insight, individual by individual, about their performance. And it also focuses the education system very much on ensuring that every young person is able to fulfil their potential as a consequence of that analysis. But you don't, you can accept that it provides an individual by individual and classroom by classroom level of information. Uh, but you can also acknowledge that it, it does not include the wider context that the SSLN did. And, and surely, uh, while it's a survey, that, that survey-based approach, uh, statistical gathering on the basis of sampling, is, a, is an established and accepted uh, approach to, to gathering data by the government, is it not? It, of, of, course, uh, of course it is. But what we are interested in is making sure that every young person is able to fulfil their potential through access to a high quality education. And the SSLN does not enable us to be assured of that point because the, the SSLN gives us a survey across the whole country. It doesn't say to us um, in a particular classroom, in a particular school, young people are not performing as well as they should be able to perform and there are issues to be addressed there. So that, and, and, and fundamentally, that to me, is the critical point in our education system that parents will be concerned about. Is my child getting a good education? Are they getting all the support they require to fulfil their potential? And that's 
what the uh, approach to assessment mechanism that we have designed and which is now attracting a significant amount of attention internationally um, is designed to do, to give us that ability to um, rely on teacher judgment informed by high quality standardised assessments which form part of the judgment that teachers make as to whether young people are achieving what is expected of them in the curriculum. But, but fundamentally, Mr Sweeney, do you accept that you cannot aggregate the data in the same way that you could do under SSLN and thereby you, you just do not have the same system level information and data that you would do under SSLN, which follows a, a more orthodox statistical gathering methodology? Oh, I, th I, th I think we've actually got more information available to us than we have ever had in the past because if the committee was to look at the, um, the elements of the National Improvement Framework where we uh, openly assess uh, performance within the education system to determine the progress that is being made, there are a range of indicators in that in which we gather data to determine progress within the education system and to explore many of the contextual arguments that um, Mr Johnson has raised. But then that's also uh, deeply relies upon the judgment made school by school, classroom by classroom, individual by individual that teachers are undertaking, uh, which has now reached a, you know, a, 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 a really robust level of assessment according to the chief statistician. Um, that, that enables us then to, uh, to form judgments about the progress of young people through the education system. Yeah, I'd just like to ask one final question with regards to additional support needs and the administering of uh, uh, these uh, tests. And I, and I note from the government's submission that the, well, the, 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 the government states that it, it, it can be useful for identifying children with issues, that it's not designed to do so. And, and as the Cabinet Secretary will know, I, I raised concerns uh, previously in Parliament about the impact uh, that these tests might have on children uh, with undiagnosed conditions such as uh, uh, autistic spectrum disorder or ADHD. Um, I, I'm just wondering what work the government has undertaken to assess the impact uh, that these tests might have as they're administered on children with undiagnosed conditions. And I, I acknowledge that, that the Cabinet Secretary you know, does take an interest in these areas, so I'd, I just appreciate your, your comments and views well, on those. I, th I, think, I, think we've got to, I think we've got to act with extraordinary care here and I, I think that's I think our approach on this question is the, the is the same as it should be in relation to any child of us trying to identify what are the particular needs <coughs> of an individual child if we if we are going to live by the maxim of getting it right for every child. We have got to look with care at how each child is um, able to take forward their journey through our education system. So the SNSA is no different to any other aspect of trying to identify what are the needs of individual children within the system. And I, I, I would want to confirm with Mr Johnson that I don't see the um, the SNSA as a means of identifying um, an undiagnosed condition, what the SNSA will offer teachers is very good and rich diagnostic information about educational challenges of young people, but that has to be laid alongside wider assessments of the issues that young people may face, and then from that, what support they need to have put in place to enable their needs to be addressed. So I think we've got to view this not in a compartmentalised fashion that the SNACs have a particular purpose in that respect. We have to view this as part of the wider obligation on the education system and our child uh, and our children's services approach to make sure that the needs of children and young people are being met effectively. Uh, and where there are additional needs, uh, we put in place the support to assist those young people. Can I just push you on the very specific point, though? I mean, has, has that question been raised within government about the, the, the particular impact that, it, it, that these tests might have, especially on younger children who have undiagnosed conditions, in terms of, of stress and anxiety, that, that potentially they might... Has that question been raised? Has any work been carried out? Well, there is, um, there is 
Um, within the guidance around um, SNSAs, um, there is a, a clear um, element of guidance which says to the teaching profession that they should apply professional judgment as to whether it is appropriate for a young person to undertake uh, this assessment. So there is no, there is nothing mandatory about this. Teacher judgment should always be applied as to whether a young person will be uh, suited to undertake this assessment. So uh, that, that comes back to my fundamental point about us getting it right for every child. No teacher is obliged to undertake this assessment. If they think it will not be suitable for a child, they should exercise that professional judgment not to uh, have the child take the SNSA. Um, and we obviously look carefully at the feedback from teachers and from pupils about their experience of those assessments uh, to determine whether or not there are any other further issues and points of guidance that we need to address in that respect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I um, maybe ask a, a question, Cabinet Secretary, during the course of that um, in, uh, investigation by the committee, um, at some times we heard um, concerns about teacher workload and um, the impact of um, conducting the test on, on, on timescale in the classroom and at the same time um, from the academic community demands for even more data and more statistics. Are you content that the balance is right and you've got the information now that you need to be able to monitor the education system in Scotland? I, I think we have much more data and much more useful data about um, monitoring the performance of young people through the education system and then of supporting them in meeting their needs to enable them to fulfil their potential. Uh, I am always mindful of issues in relation to teacher workload and um, I believe that the, um, the agenda that we are pursuing uh, in partnership with professional associations is now making significant progress on identifying, uh, of addressing that issue, so that teachers are able to exercise much more confident judgments about how they spend their time and how they invest their time in supporting the needs of learners. So um, I feel we have in place now the type of robust um, data analysis that the OECD called for us to put in place in 2015. Uh, the committee will recall that the OECD said to us in 2015 that we did not have sufficient and robust data to monitor progress of young people through our education system. We essentially didn't have um, a, 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 an approach which gave us that comparability across um, young people until they got to the senior phase. It's so leaving it far too late. We now have that in place, and I think that is being effectively delivered by the teaching profession, given the fact that we, uh, the, the participation rate in SNSAs is um, in 2018-19 was 93.4 per cent. And we obviously have teachers providing the, the data and information that will be released a week on Tuesday in relation to the performance of young people within the education system. Thank you. Um, can you move to Dr Allen? Thank you very much. Um, one of the things uh, in the committee's report uh, on subject choices uh, was a recommendation around an independent review of, of the senior phase. Um, and be keen to hear more, if you could say more about the government reaction to not just that, that idea of a review, but also what it would mean specifically around subject choices. Well, the, the, uh, I, as, as I've confirmed to Parliament and as I reiterated to the committee this morning, I. Um, I intend to commission um, a review of the senior phase. Um, it was envisaged at the time of the OECD review of the broad general <coughs> education, um, and I think we've reached a point where um, that is necessary for us to undertake that. Um, it will be led by the OECD, who led the um, review of the broad general education in 2015. I think that's welcome external leadership of the, uh, of the review. I'm very keen for it to be um, to command the participation and the engagement of the profession within Scotland, because it's important that the, the voice of the profession is heard loud and clear in that process. It's also vital that it hears the, the views and the input of young people. Uh, one of the um, essential parts, strengths of the Scottish education system is now uh, the more audible um, 
a hearing of pupil voice within our education system, so I'm keen to make sure that that pupil voice is heard. Um, I've invited the committee to provide me with input on uh, the remit of the review uh, to uh, ensure that we proceed on um, as broad, with as broad agreement as we possibly can do. And um, I look forward to um, seeing the, the fruits of that review in due course. Thank you. One of the things, as you know, that the committee has been interested in is, is the impact um, on individual subjects. Um, now, as you rightly mentioned, there's a, an emphasis in the system on autonomy for local authorities and schools, and indeed autonomy for individual young people when making choices. I just wondered if you have a, any kind of view about what happens when certain subjects don't get chosen. And I'm thinking, for example, computing science appears to have suffered a very significant decline in the number of people taking it. So I just wonder how far does this autonomy and this, this choice go if, if individual subjects suffer? The, the, the answer to that, I, that question I don't think is just contained in information around the senior phase. It has to be contained with um, attention to the contents of the broad general education because across the eight curricular areas we expect young people to have experience of a broad general education. So up until the end of S3, we expect young people to be able to have that breadth of experience which um, uh, would enable them uh, to be in command of uh, all of those elements. Uh, I think the, the issue that Dr Allen raises with me gets to, I suppose, the nub of some of the, the, the pretty hard issues that we have to consider is around what is the level of prescription that we wish to put into the education system of what we think it is necessary and obligatory for young people to undertake. Um, we say in our guidance to the system that we expect all young people to have a command of literacy, numeracy and health and well-being. We believe those to be the three preeminent aspects of the curriculum that young people must have command of uh, to enable them to contribute to our society. If we wish to be more prescriptive about that, then we would have to change the direction of policy that we take forward because fundamentally, and, and this is one of the issues which I think gets is really at the heart of, of this question, and the committee has acknowledged this, um, there is more choice available to young people in our education system today. I think that's very obvious. Um, I think the question the committee wrestles with is whether or not there should be more prescription around certain elements that it believes young people should, in all circumstances, have a command of. Now, that's a, that, that's a debate to be had. Um, uh, you know, I've taken the view uh, up until now that the advice we have given the, the system of the, the primacy of literacy, numeracy and health and well-being is the appropriate advice. But if we, if we decide as an education system we should be more prescriptive, then that's, that's clearly an option. Um, it's not one that I've taken so far, but the fact that we're having this review gives us the opportunity to explore in detail some of the issues that Dr Allen raises in his question. Thank you. And I suppose related to that, that question, that maybe not necessarily around prescription, but um, around some of the issues that, as a committee, we've, we've attempted to take up with um, Education Scotland and, and evidence in the past um, are around languages. And as you know, I've asked you about this issue before, uh, you know, I have an interest in it. But um, I'm just curious as to whether um, the government has had any opportunity to reflect on some of the specific evidence that was given to us uh, around the specific problems around languages being... Uh, perhaps dropped in second or third year, and then the, the assumption or the hope that they would be taken up in sixth year again, not really materialising. Um, certainly some of the evidence that we had from, from language teachers and so on were, were around that specific issue. And again, I appreciate what we then get drawn into issues of prescription and all sorts of other things. Um, but we did, as a committee, get a lot of evidence that suggested there was anxiety about that specific point when it came to languages. I think... Obviously, the, the government has made a priority of investing in languages. The one plus two languages policy has seen 
uh, over £30 million pounds of investment made by the government in uh, recent years to support the uh, development of the 1 plus 2 approach. Um, that has um, seen its application throughout the broad general education. Um, the point that Dr Allen raises with me is, should we then essentially apply more obligation on the pursuit of languages through the senior phase? And I, you know, I, I, th I think that's a, a, an issue to, to debate and to consider. Um, we haven't taken the view that we should prescribe that. I think the data about entries into national qualifications will give us some of the picture about the experience of, uh, of, of young people and the interests of young people and whether they wish to prioritise language learning. Um, that, uh, and that data speaks for itself. Um, but of course there is an opportunity for us to consider whether or not uh, we should put um, more obligation into the system. Um, and that's one of the issues which I'm quite sure will be considered by the senior phase review. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Uh, Mr Gray? Um, really just to uh, follow up on uh, Dr Allen's line of questioning, um, you've talked around a little bit this issue of the level of prescription in the curriculum and subject choice. Um, and it's certainly true that the committee's report into subject choice expressed or reflected concerns that we'd had expressed to us in evidence that certain subjects, notably languages, particularly Gaelic was one of them, and uh, STEM subjects, particularly computer science was another, were in danger of being squeezed out of the curriculum altogether. Um, and you've talked a bit around that, but at a meeting um, last month, Cabinet Secretary, you were quoted as saying, this, let's have the curriculum driven by young people and what they're interested in rather than by what old duffers like me are interested in. So do you mean by that that we should not be concerned at subjects such as modern languages, such as STEM subjects, dropping out of our curriculum? What, what, I'm, what, what, I'm, what I was um, expressing in... in, in that rather more casual language than I am perhaps famed for, um, uh, which Mr Gray has raised with me before, is that ultimately uh, I think we've got to listen carefully to the voice and the views of pupils. Because ultimately, pupils must be motivated by the curricular choices they make. And I, I accept there's a legitimate discussion about prescription. So my, my view, my answer to my answer to Dr. Allen a moment ago is a slightly more elegant equivalent of the quote that Mr. Gray has put to me just now, <coughs> whereby I, I, I don't believe, as it stands just now, that we should be more prescriptive about the curriculum, because I think young people should be able to exercise choice around a much broader range of topics and subjects that meet their needs. That's my, that's my philosophical position. But I'm in, I'm in front of the committee today opening up a senior phase review where I'm, I think that's a perfectly legitimate question to be explored. So we're at a point where Mr Gray is quite fairly able to marshal evidence that shows a decline in participation in certain subjects. And the committee's heard some of that evidence. The committee has also heard evidence which indicates that the current approaches that are available to young people are delivering for them a more satisfying and appropriate curriculum. And I think we've got to be mindful of that evidence into the bargain. So as with all things in education, there are legitimate arguments that support my point of view in listening to the views of young people. There are equally legitimate points of view, le legitimate arguments that supports the point of view that Mr Gray is advancing to me today. And I think this is an opportunity for us to consider those questions and to decide if there is any need for us to be any more prescriptive than we have been to date. Uh, I mean, in a way, that would be fine if you were, in fact, a casual observer, Mr Swinney, but you're not. You're the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills. And we, we have a dysfunctionality here in government policy, don't we? Because we have in the one plus two policy, which you referred to a moment ago, uh, an attempt to ensure that modern languages 
uh, as a subject is studied and preserved in our curriculum. We have a STEM strategy. We were debating in Parliament only yesterday with one of the ministers from your team, which is designed to try and ensure that more young people take more STEM subjects because we believe that that would be useful. But your position is that that's daft. What you say is, I fear the logic of the report, our report, is that young people will be required to do subjects in which they have no interest, and if we agree to that, then we are daft. So I, 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 I ask you, what is government policy here? Are we trying to get young, more young people to do modern, study modern languages, study STEM subjects, or is that just things that old duffers like you and me are interested in? Well, Which is it? Well, I think uh, you know, I, I, I would contend that a uh, government policy is crystal clear here. We are <laughs> well. Well, if, if Mr. D uh, I, I always give Mr Gray the courtesy of engaging in these questions, I'll, if he'd allow me to do so uh, as well. Um, government policy is aimed to um, encourage young people to take an interest in modern languages. It's designed to encourage young people to participate in the STEM subjects. But where, the bit, where it comes together with my view is that we have to respect the choices that are made by young people and the interests that they have. And I suppose, where Mr Gray, if, I, if, we, if we narrow it down, what Mr Gray is saying to me is that we should oblige young people to do subjects that they, although we've encouraged them to be interested in modern languages and some of the STEM subjects, if at the point that it comes to make the choice they're not that keen on doing so, we should oblige them to do so. Now, that is not gov government policy. Government policy is to say, let's do the encouragement and then let's let young people choose from a broader range of topics and subjects what they wish to take forward. If we were to change that government policy, then it would be to move to the point that Mr Gray is advancing to me. Now, that is not currently government policy. And that's, that's an issue. However, I'm perfectly happy to have debated and considered within the senior phase review. No. What the report says is that the evidence shows a reduction in the number of subjects which can be chosen, not the number available to choose, the number which can be chosen by pupils in the senior phase in school, as a result of which some subjects in particular have seen a significant decline. So the, the, the choice is not driven by interest, it is driven by the curriculum model in which these young people are studying. And that is the concern which the report, which the report uh, brings forward. It also says, the evidence says, and the report reflects, that that restriction of choice is greater in school serving areas of deprivation than elsewhere. So this is not just a problem with regard to subjects, it's a problem with regard to fairness. Um, I think there's, 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 there's a number of different elements within that question. Um, on the, the, the question about the number of choices that young people make, and I rehearsed this when I was here at the committee some months ago, um, relates to whether one takes the view that an individual year of choices sums up what a young people can undertake or whether we're looking at that over a three-year period of a senior phase. And uh, I would contend that over the three years of a senior phase, there is the opportunity for young people to be able to undertake the range of, uh, pursue the range of opportunities that Mr. Gray has raised with me. One of the reasons why that, that was a motivation within the education system, again, this goes back to the foundations around Curriculum for Excellence, was because uh, there was a sense that we were over-examining young people and that we were adding to the stress of young people by the range of qualifications that were required of them to undertake. So there are, contest there are contested propositions in amongst that question as well. To move then on to the, the question of... Um, so I, I would say that over a three-year senior phase, there is the opportunity for young people to be able to pursue that range of opportunities that I've talked about and that Mr Gray has raised with me, and that... Um, there are models 
uh, clearly available around the country which enable that to be the case. The second point is in relation to the availability of options within areas of deprivation. And I think one of the, the very, and, and I have no interest whatsoever in there being a lack of opportunity for young people in deprived areas. So I want to maximise those options that are available to young people. But when I look at the, 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 the choices and the options that are available in schools in what will be called areas of deprivation, I see a huge breadth of opportunity available to young people. And I think schools are excelling themselves to make sure that range of opportunities is available. There will be, because often many of these schools are involve smaller cohorts, challenges in the delivery of that range of opportunities. And I want to make sure that we have in place uh, some of the shared arrangements, the partnerships with colleges that enable us to maximise that choice for young people. And I think there is increasing evidence that that is the case. Um, but fundamentally, um, we have to look at addressing the aspirations and needs of young people within these localities and making sure we put in place credible opportunities for them to prosper as a consequence. Are, are you suggesting their needs and aspirations are different from those of, of children in schools that serve better off communities? I, I, I think there will, be, there will be a range of aspirations and, uh, and needs in any school and they will vary to a greater or lesser extent um, because all schools will be different. And just one last thing, another area uh, that the subject choice report focused on, um, which really was a, a phenomenon which came out in the evidence, it wasn't part of the original purpose of the survey, was the widespread use of um, multi-level, three and four uh, level teaching. Um, you spoke earlier, Cabinet Secretary, about a relentless focus on enhancing learning and teaching. Do you think the extensive use of multi-level teaching is enhancing learning and teaching? There is, as Mr Gray will be familiar, um, because we've rehearsed these uh, points in, 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 in other discussions, um, multi-level teaching has been a feature of the Scottish education system for many years. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not something that is new. And indeed, at the time of the inception of Curriculum for Excellence and um, there was um, an acceptance um, in the um, Education Scotland guidance, February 2013, progression from the broad general education to the senior phase. Um, there was guidance which talked of delivering S4 to S6 as a single cohort within which young people can opt for a, a mixture of subjects and levels and learn in mixed age groups. This can help provide a wider range of classes. And Sorry, Cabinet Secretary, that's a mixed age group. That's not the same thing as a mixed level. <coughs> that's a different thing altogether. Well, there is... But you, you, no, that's a different thing altogether. But the, 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 the S4 to S6 single cohort No, was that means S4 and S6 could be in the same class studying at the same level. But, but <laughs> there, there was... Uh, but I, you know, I think well, that, that, point, that, point, that point of guidance to me reflects what we are seeing in multi-level no, teaching through the way in which the, no, it means um, completely where, different. The, where we take forward that uh, approach. Now, the key thing for me is to look at what is the evidence saying to me. And I've, you know, I haven't yet got from uh, in, uh, inspection evidence um, any information that suggests that multi-level teaching is in any way undermining the quality of education. Indeed, that was confirmed to the committee in the letter from the Chief Inspector of Education and the Chief Examining Officer, um, which the committee has just received. Now, obviously, we, we, we are about to commence uh, a review of the senior phase, and we can explore these questions and to see if there is um, a, a necessity for us to address this question. Um, but what I think it's indicative of, what multi-level teaching is indicative of, is a desire on the part of the education system to try to ensure that young people have the access to the broadest choice possible in the education system. 
But, but, but absolutely. But why does that necessitate them being taught in three and four level classes? The only reason that's necessary is if the resources and staffing are not available in order to provide uh, those to provide those classes at the different levels. But 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 let me let me just well, could, I, could, 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 I, could, could, could I just address that particular point first? I think inevitably like, I can't sit here and say that every young person in Scotland is going to be able to study every national qualification they want in their own local school, because that depends on a number of factors. And I think Mr Gray would have to accept this point from his experience in the education system, that it will depend on the size of cohorts that are available and the resources that can be deployed to do so. Um, and if we, you know, if, if we were to try to do that, you know, we potentially you know, I think that would be a potentially unsustainable approach. And, and I can't, in all honesty, sit here and say that I think there is a model that can deliver that type of premise. So what schools are trying to do is they are trying to use the resources they have to maximise the choice and availability of options for young people within their schools. And I think schools should be commended for doing that, so. That's correct. They are being forced to use multi-level teaching in order to deliver the curriculum. My but, question but, to you, but, 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 my but question schools always, to you but, but was, school, but schools always have no. Done, that's not true. My well, question have, to you, have. that's not true. My question to you was, is that, in your view, enhancing learning and teaching? Um, because teachers don't think it is. I'm asking if you think it is. Um, well, the. There is no evidence that I have from inspection evidence that suggests that is the case. And indeed, going back to the, um, the guidance from Education Scotland, um, it talked about uh, delivering typically two-year programmes for young people to learn across two levels, such as National 5 and higher. So, you know, the, 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 the design of curriculum for excellence envisaged this would be the case. We have to be open to evidence as to whether that is, um, is, is, is a challenge within the education system, because fundamentally, I don't want young people's um, experience of education to be in any way um, constrained by such an approach. Um, but neither do I want young people's choice to be constrained by the fact that we have to teach at um, multiple levels which has always been a feature of the education system in Scotland. Okay. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, I'm moving to Ms Harris. Yes, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I appreciate you've probably answered my questions, but I'm just going to run back through them again, if you don't mind. So I know, Mr Swinney, that you cite the increase in the number of new qualifications available to young people as justification of the success of the CFE. But that must surely be set alongside what is happening to the core qualifications, which is a matter of considerable concern, as we've heard, to parents, young people and employers. So recent evidence has shown that from levels three to five, we have an increase in the number of annual alternative qualifications of 15,000. But that's got to be set against the decline of uh, 165,000 of annual traditional course, you know, course qualifications. So, just for my own clarification, can you explain to me again that are you concerned with these figures? First thing I'd say is that uh, Alison has used a term there of core qualifications. Now, uh, beyond what I said in my earlier answers about the necessity of young people to have command of literacy, numeracy, and health and well-being. Uh, I'm not aware of a definition of core qualifications, and I don't... Perhaps I should have said course qualifications. Did I, did I say the wrong word? It, no, it, 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 it's, it doesn't matter in the answer that I'm giving. It's, it's about whether or not, and it comes back to my answer to Ian Gray earlier on, about how prescriptive are we about what young people should be pursuing within the education system. So I think, if again, if we want to have a discussion about what needs to be core qualifications, um, then let us have that discussion. But that's not a feature of Curriculum for Excellence and its design. Um, the second point I would make is that we have to look at the range of qualifications that young people are achieving 
um, across uh, the whole of the senior phase. And earlier on, I cited um, the data which looks at um, the range of awards that have been achieved by young people. And what we see at all of the levels at one, two, three, four, five or more awards at SCQF levels five and SCQF levels six, an increase in the proportion of young people achieving awards at that level between 2016 and 2019. So I think what we see is a pattern of rising attainment within our schools, but it's attainment across a broader range of experiences um, for, and, and courses for young people. And the last point I would make is that I think there is really um, industrious effort undertaken within schools <coughs> to, um, to ensure that young people are, have access to a broader range of opportunities and options. And I see schools trying to expand that year on year to ensure that they're meeting the needs of young people. Okay, well, I'll just stick to using the word course subjects, but some course subjects have seen a radical downturn. And I know that we've heard it from Mr Gray and we've heard from Mr Allen, but if I could just ask you about this. Professor Valdera Gill provided evidence to this committee showing that in 2012, there was around 30,000 entries in French at, uh, at below higher. And in 2018, there was just 11,000. So that's actually a two-thirds drop. And that feeds through to higher because since 2016, ATC passes in French are down 27% approximately and German 25%. Now, so my concern is if I look at these trends and the picture going forward, and I've heard your answers that, you know, you've said to both Mr Gray and Mr Allen, but if you think about it this way and come back to me, if we look at that and we look at the time frame we're referring to, which is six years, what I'm basically saying is that in the course of the next parliament, so within a six year time frame, if we look at those trends and they continue to go this way, modern languages, Mr Swinney, are going the same way as the classic languages of Latin and Greek. And um, at higher, they're virtually becoming extinct. So I really think surely you must be concerned about these figures. You know, and, and also, you know, you have to accept that it basically is the restriction on these numbers is also down to subject choice in S4? Well, the, if, I think there's a, there's a broader answer to the question that Alison Harris raises with me about languages. If you look at um, the effect of the one plus two language policy that the government has taken forward, um, the most recent information shows that 88% of primary schools and 70% of secondary schools are providing the full entitlement to learning a second language from P1 to P7 and from S1 to S3. So we have very formidable levels of language tuition going on within our schools. When we then move on into the senior phase, um, we're seeing uh, total passes of language hires in 2019, 4% um, higher than when the government came to office in 2007. And I think the question of whether the volume of qualifications pursued or courses adopted um, it has to be considered in that discussion about what is the level of prescription that we intend to put into the education system uh, to, to oblige young people to continue beyond where the broad general education essentially provides that learning opportunity for young people through the one plus two languages policy. So I think that, that, that there's a debate to be had there um, but fundamentally, um, you know, the, 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 much of this debate is driven by the choices that young people are making, but where they are making the choices of languages, their performance is improving. Okay, thank you. And I know, Cabinet Secretary, that you know, you're a proponent of Professor Mark Priestley's work. So do you agree with his assertion that the CFE is built on the right principles but it's just its structure needs to be adjusted to deliver better results? Well, I, 
I, I, I wouldn't, um, I, I'm not, I can't quite remember the word that Alison Plessy used to describe my, my view of Professor Priestley. I think Professor Priestley is a commentator that's contributing to a debate on education. And you know, there's lots of commentators contribute to the debate on education. And I think it's important to reflect on the totality of the advice and guidance that, that we get. Um, I think Professor Priestley um, has, you know, has made the comments that he has made in relation to the foundations of CFE. Um, I very much value the fact that uh, Parliament has uh, continuously and most recently reinforced its belief that Curriculum for Excellence is the right curricular choice for Scotland. I believe that fundamentally. I think it equips young people with the skills they require for the future. But as with any, but as with any curriculum, we have got to be open to considering the effectiveness of the curriculum. That's why we had a review of the broad general education in 2015, and it's why we're having a review of the senior phase at this stage. So, you know, curriculum, and where I very much agree with Professor Priestley, is that curriculum doesn't stand still, nor should it, because the world changes around us. So as the world changes around us, so we must look to consider the detail of our curriculum as well. Okay, so on committee, you know, we've heard that there is a disconnect between the BGE and the senior phase, leading to a restriction in the number of subject choices. So are you at all worried about the number of schools which do not provide comprehensive information on their websites about what subject choice options are available? Um, I, I look at a lot of information that schools uh, produce for their um, parental community on subject choices. Um, I think the, there is a, a lot of information that's available. Um, I probably have some of it in my pretty sure I have it, uh, I did have it in my pack here, at one stage of a, of a number of examples where schools uh, publish and make available information on their choices. What I think it's clear to discern from um, the information that's available is that schools are working um, effectively to try to broaden that uh, choice and range of opportunities that are available for young people and I would encourage them to do so. Okay, and finally, I would just like to ask that, you know, one of the current issues surrounding the debate about attainment measures is concern over the lack of relevant data. So something I know that this committee has heard on numerous occasions, but what is the Scottish Government doing to address this? I think we've got a huge amount and a growing amount of data that's available on the performance of our education system. You know, as I said, in one of my earlier answers, up until the introduction of the reporting of levels data, which started in 2017, 17, um, we did not have published information on the progress of young people through our education system until essentially we had their performance in the SQA qualifications at the end of S4. So we had nothing up until then. Now, I accept that was a weakness. And the, B, the, um, the OECD, in their review of the broad general education, highlighted that. It's why the government put in place the levels data, which will be published uh, a week on Tuesday. So I think that gives us a much more um, co coherent and consistent staged progress of young people, or assessment of the progress of young people through the education system. We then obviously have the data that's available through SQ national qualifications. And then I've also cited the gathering together of all of that data with um, other school performance information that relates to um, qualifications out with the SQA national qualifications through the insight data at Scottish credit and qualifications level. Um, add to that the information that is available on um, the progress of young people through every stage of the education system. And I think we have um, a much more comprehensive amount of data that's able to be interrogated about the, the journey of young people and the progress that they have made. Now, I'm mindful uh, at all times about uh, the demands that we place on the profession to gather data, um, because obviously it adds to workload and, and I have to be mindful of that at all times. But I do think we now have a more um, robust volume of data that's available to us uh, to chart progress through the education system. 
as it affects young people. And of course, we gather lots of that information together in the um, Broad General Education uh, dashboard, which gives schools an indication of their performance in comparison with a virtual comparator, essentially looking at the social and economic demography of the school and, is, and comparing that with what the, a general system-wide level of performance would be. And that will show schools whether they are um, reaching or surpassing or not reaching the levels that their virtual comparator would suggest they should be able to achieve. OK, <coughs> thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, could I possibly ask a supplementary question around the, the use of school websites, um, uh, something that Professor Scott based a lot of his evidence on. Is a challenge for the schools going forward um, the explanation of what other options of study there are um, that could be available through cluster use? Um, my, my own son's school website, to all intents and purposes, advanced higher music wasn't available. He was able to study that at a neighbouring school. And also the, the opportunities for foundation apprenticeships and actually studying uh, at local colleges as well. I, how do you see schools being able to give that further information better? To I, I think you know, schools should be open in presenting the information that um, they can about the options that are available. I think some of the examples you cite, convener, um, might be practical issues that uh, are slightly more difficult to navigate because the, the, it may it may be individual arrangements that schools are trying to put in place. Um, I certainly, when I look at the information in the head teacher survey that we undertook, um, th there was a, an expressed uh, appetite within that survey to make sure that um, the aspirations of young people in terms of subject choices were being met within the education system, and the um, the, 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 the the information that should be available more widely to inform pupil and parental choice should be the broadest uh, information that's possibly available. Um, now, if there, is, if there is a need to enhance that level of openness and communication, then we should be, we should be open to that. And I, I certainly entirely support uh, an open approach in this respect. Thank you. Um, can we move to Ross Greer? Thank you, Convener. Uh, this is in part following up uh, Ian Gray's first line of questioning. Um, just to begin with, Cabinet Secretary, um, do you accept that a pupil in one of Scotland's most deprived communities will, on average, have considerably fewer hires offered to them to choose from than a pupil from one of Scotland's most privileged communities? It doesn't necessarily need to be like that because of the um, wider arrangements that are available for um, the, 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 the opening up of opportunities through a joint timetabling with other schools. So, uh, provided there's an, an, a, a willingness to create the type of partnerships that are envisaged under Curriculum for Excellence, then I don't see why that would be an impediment. At present, do you believe that is or is not the case, though? Uh, I, I accept what you're saying, that if, if uh, cluster models work correctly, etc., etc., this would be less of an issue. At present, what do you believe is the situation? Uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't have in front of me evidence that suggests that that is um, restricted for young people, but I'm obviously very happy to consider evidence that would suggest it is. I think that would be helpful. We raised this with um, Education Scotland during the, the course of the subject, Choice Inquiry. So about two years ago, the Times newspaper did relatively simple investigation on this through freedom of information requests, but a number of academics have done so since. I think Jim Scott did some work on it. I know uh, Barry Black at, at Aberdeen University did, and it indicated very strongly that, on average, you, pupils in Scotland's most deprived communities had a choice of, of hires that was about six, six fewer than uh, in Scotland's most uh, privileged communities. Um, part of the, the issue here, though, is about um, who's actually responsible for identifying whether or not this is a problem. So before I get on to what, would, what should happen on a regular basis, the review of the senior phase, will that consider this issue, the, the disparity in subject availability based on uh, socioeconomic factors and potentially rurality, which is something else we identified? Mm -hmm. I'm certainly very happy for it to do so. And, and that's why I've invited the committee to give me its thoughts on what should be in the remit of the review, why I haven't finalised that until um, I've heard from the committee um, to enable me to make sure that we proceed with the broadest possible canvas. That'd be very helpful. Thank you. Um, on a regular basis, though, obviously this is a, a one-off um, external review. On a regular <coughs> basis, who should be responsible for 
monitoring this, identifying whether or not problems such as this are emerging. Is that something that's Education Scotland's responsibility? Um, ultimately, Education Scotland um, is responsible for um, considering the effectiveness and the appropriateness of the curricular model that an individual school will undertake. But, fun but fundamentally, the responsibility for the delivery of education at local level is a responsibility of the school within its obligations to the local authority that carries the statutory responsibility for the delivery of education in that locality. This appears so to I be suppose a national they, so, issue. So the answer, uh, you know, ultimately, the answer to Mr. Greer's question is it's the responsibility of the local authority because that's where the statutory responsibility for delivery of education rests. This is a national issue, though, and the socio-economic trends in Scotland are, are nothing new, and they are national. Um, and we do have that is broadly grouped by local authority. If I take my own region and look at the, uh, the attainment challenge authorities, there's four attainment challenge authorities uh, in my region. There's also Eastern Bartonshire and East Renfrewshire, which are at the other end of the spectrum when it when it comes to attainment. To break this down to individual local authorities would fail to identify the problem that is being identified by academics and, and by journalists. So what I'm asking is, at a national level, who would be responsible for identifying whether or not these trends are occurring? Is that the responsibility of Education Scotland as the agency, or does that responsibility lie directly with yourself and the government? Uh, well, obviously, the the the, the, the I, I think I think Mr. Greer, um, in a sense, just moves past the point that I raised there in my earlier answer, which is about where the responsibility, the statutory responsibility for the delivery of education rests. I do not carry the statutory responsibility for the delivery of education. That is not my responsibility. That rests with local authorities. And they must satisfy themselves that they are delivering education effectively in that locality. That's what the law says. Now, there will be external assessment of that by Education Scotland, and out of Education Scotland analysis of individual schools or local authorities will come um, uh, assessments of performance which ultimately may feature in a national assessment of the education system. And uh, from that, national policy could be determined uh, to essentially influence the statutory delivery by local authorities of education in their local area. I accept, because it's obvious, that local authorities have the statutory responsibility to deliver education. It is not the responsibility of any individual local authority to assess these national trends. I'm presenting before you a national issue that has been presented to us. Education Scotland seemed extremely reluctant to take responsibility for identifying whether or not uh, it was a problem. And I'm simply seeking clarity from you as the Cabinet Secretary where responsibility lies for identifying whether or not this is a problem. That's one step before deciding how we go about resolving the problem, which I absolutely agree is going to ultimately come down to local authorities as those delivering education. But to identify a problem that it's, it's clearly a national trend that can be mapped nationally. Surely the responsibility is either with Education Scotland or directly with yourself. Well, the, the, what you will, if we take you know, this particular example, um, uh, let's say for, for argument's sake that evidence is emerging from individual school inspections of a particular problem, Education Scotland may undertake um, what's referred to as a thematic inspection, which may raise issues of a more general nature within the system, which is a, a, a thematic inspection that is relevant to the whole of the education system, but it's also relevant to me as the minister responsible. So ultimately, the policy responsibility uh, rests with me. And I, I, you know, I, I hope I've made that clear in the course of my answers today, that I am uh, ultimately responsible for education policy in Scotland. And education policy will, of course, be informed by educational performance which Education Scotland reports more widely to, but specifically to me, uh, about, uh, uh, about performance within the education system. So it will be a combination of um, those sources, channels of information that will ultimately formulate education policy. And if I give Mr Greer a concrete example of that, um, 
the, the information that um, we have gathered and which we have reflected upon has led us directly to the formulation of the attainment challenge, which is obviously influencing performance in a number of the local authorities within the region that Mr Greer represents, which is an, it's an illustration of how the assessment of the progress of the education system, which in that case has identified the persistent presence of a poverty-related attainment gap, then is responded to by national policy, which is about establishing a Scottish attainment challenge, putting in place the schools programme, putting in place pupil equity funding, and having a system-wide effort to try to tackle the poverty-related attainment gap, which I would consider to be, well, which, it, which is, um, the central tenet of the government's education policy today. So if, uh, if I'm interpreting this correctly, Education Scotland have the responsibility for school inspections. If through the inspections they are identifying a trend or recurring issue, they have a responsibility to engage in a thematic inspection, the results of which, the findings of which would ultimately come before you. So the, the responsibility for identifying whether or not these issues are beginning to occur or have been occurring sits with Education Scotland. Yeah, that, would, that, would be, that would be my view of the way in which the system is designed to operate. But, the, inf but the, the, the impact of Education Scotland's analysis shouldn't just be on me in terms of education policy. It should also be on those responsible through statute for the delivery of education at local level, which is local authorities. So education Scotland, when we engaged uh, with them on this question, said that on the basis of the evidence they had, this issue of subject availability and, and, and deprivation uh, was not uh, the issue that, that had otherwise been claimed. The evidence they were citing was the attainment challenge reports, but that's nine local authorities. Surely you would agree that if we're talking about the difference between pupils in our most and least deprived communities, the evidence for that cannot be simply attainment challenge reports that are based on our most deprived communities, the, the example I just cited of. In, in my region, if you're trying to find an average, you have to include Eastern Bartonshire as well as Western Bartonshire in that. If you're simply looking at the most deprived communities, you can't possibly find a national average and uh, identify whether those communities are falling below that average. Um, I think, well, I, I think the, the, the key point, I think, is to look at, um, and this has been my argument with the committee for uh, a long time, we've got to look at a broad range of evidence in any analysis of these questions. You must, uh, you know, we must consider a range of different information sources. And when I look at a range of information sources, when I look at um, the, um, the outcomes that have been achieved by uh, schools in areas of deprivation, when I look at the findings of the head teacher survey about uh, subject choice and opportunities for young people, um, th these will be information sources that will give us information to, to make a judgment about, uh, about the performance of the education system in all of our localities, but particularly to give us an insight into the question that Mr Greer raises with me. I, I appreciate that. I think it would be worth your emphasising to Education Scotland their responsibility to gather evidence from a, a range of sources. Th they did say one interesting thing, though. Um, so in, in the course of that particular line of questioning, uh, Gail Gorman said, we are finding that in areas that are not attainment challenged authorities or that are not receiving significant pupil equity funding, deprivation is a bigger factor in their curriculum offer and what they're able to do. How is the government addressing that? Um, well, fundamentally, um, we have to ensure that um, we have in place the support that enhances learning and teaching. And fu fundamentally for me, the enhancement of learning and teaching is what will improve performance within the education system. Um, so the work that I've taken forward to establish regional improvement collaboratives to ensure that we have in place um, support systems and arrangements at local level which can enhance the quality of learning and teaching by direct um, support to individual schools is fundamentally the, uh, the, the, the means to address the challenge that emerges from the Chief Inspector's uh, comment that Mr Greer has quoted. So that enhancement of the quality of support within the education system has been a central part of what I've been trying to achieve over the last uh, three and a half years. And I think we're beginning to see through the uh, very effective work of the regional improvement collaboratives, working with local authorities, and the professional associations creating more um, 
substantial, focused uh, support to enhance learning and teaching uh, that we're beginning to see that improvement in performance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Johnson. Thank you. I, I just wanted to follow up on one of the points that, that Ross Greer touched on there in terms of the, the, the distinction between the delivery of education which rests with local authority and the policy um, uh, and in particular how that will relate to the terms of reference for the, the, the examination of uh, subject choice. So uh, if I can just ask Cabinet Secretary two kind of uh, points around the assumptions and then what that might contain. There. So first of all, would he accept that the design of both the curriculum but more importantly um, qualifications is very much a, a, a policy issue? Then related to that, that those will, by definition, have an impact on subject choice. Uh, and therefore, in, you know, finally, will that mean that those elements will be part of that investigation? Because I note in his opening re remarks when he, he was talking about design, he was, he, he was specifically related that to uh, the way that that is implemented at local authority level. Because if you follow that logic, surely this investigation has to look at the qualification design and, and curriculum design as well. I just wonder if he ex accepts that, 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 that logic. I, I, I understand exactly the territory Mr Johnson's in with his question. I, in a sense, Mr Johnson's question highlights the, the complexity of the pursuit of education policy because he, you know, Mr Johnson is absolutely correct. There is an interrelationship between curriculum and qualifications. But there are um, different approaches to the design of, or different responsibilities around the design of qualifications than there can and should be in relation to the design of the curriculum. And if I can explain that point, I don't set the exams. I never should set the exams. I should, the, 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 the design of qualifications must be undertaken in, um, in a space which is essentially um, independent of government because that provides the external insurance about the validity of what has been achieved in the education system. But the qualifications should be designed in a fashion that follows the curriculum. It should never be the other way around. So therefore, the, the, the purpose of the senior phase review is to look at the curricular aspects of the senior phase review and if there are issues that come out of that that have an implication for the qualifications then we should look at those implications so that it's the curriculum that is driving the uh, design of our qualification system not the other way around. Uh, and just finally, just as a, a detail on that, I mean, I, I think the Cabinet Secretary would accept that in terms of the, the, the detailed design of the, the curriculum, absolutely will take place at local level. But things such as benchmarks and ease and O's, those are not defined at local authority level. They're, they're defined at a national level. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that has to be part, surely part of the examination of, 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 of the breadth. Well, it, well if, I give, if, 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 if I give Mr Johnson a very specific example of this, when the benchmarks, up until 2017, benchmarks? Between 15 and 17. So, <coughs> benchmarks were introduced into the system in 2000 and, in draft in 2016, in full in 2017. Up until then, th there had not, th well, prior to that, there were experiences and outcomes which were nationally set, and Mr Johnson is absolutely correct in that respect. But my judgment, listening to the profession, was that the experiences and outcomes, however valuable, were not giving a clear enough shape to practitioners in the broad general education of what was expected of them at individual curricular levels, which is why the benchmarks were introduced, to give that clarity about what was expected of each of the levels of the curriculum. When it got to the summit of the benchmarks in the, in the broad general education, I insisted that the Chief Inspector of Education, who defined the benchmarks, sought agreement from the Chief Examiner of the Scottish Qualifications Authority that 
the benchmarks at the summit of the broad general education provided in the eyes of the chief examiner of the Scottish Qualifications Authority a secure foundation for young people to progress on to the senior phase. So that's the critical point. Mr Johnson's absolutely right to hone in on this. That point, if a young person is leaving the broad general education without the foundations to tackle the senior phase, it won't be any surprise that they won't perform well at the senior phase or their challenge will be more, diff will be more acute. So I sought specific assurance from the chief examiner that the benchmarks designed by the chief inspector were going to be give that consistent foundation, and I got that. So it gave me the confidence that we could apply the benchmarks to say to the education system, this is what you need to achieve in the broad general education, because it will then create the platform which enables young people to proceed and to prosper through the senior phase. Finally, cabinet secretary, Ms. Gilruth. <laughs> so, just to follow up on Daniel Johnson and Ross Greer's point of questioning, um, particularly with regard to the qualifications, I appreciate what you say, cabinet secretary, about you know, the independence of government from um, that, I suppose, in terms of setting the qualifications. However, I think I put the question to you previously about the hours allocation for um, the national qualification courses, which are 160 hours. Um, and if you add that up in a, a teaching year or a teaching um, week even, which is 22 and a half hours of uh, class contact in a 35 hour teaching week, at the end of the year, you can really only timetable about five subjects if you adhere to that 160 hours um, prescription from the SQA. So I just wanted to check because I did ask this question to the SQA and you know, I asked, why did we stick with 160? And their answer to me was, well, we did that for higher and intermediate, so we just stuck with it. Um, and I just wonder if the senior phase review is going to look at that again in terms of the pedagogy involved or, or what influence, you know, or what input government might be able to have in that process because I do <coughs> think that schools looked at the new qualifications and tried to adapt what they'd done previously and, and to timetable and fit it into what they had. And I think it was potentially a bit top down from the SQA in terms of that hour allocation. I think that is still a bit of a challenge in terms of how you timetable that and that might explain some of the variance. I think th I think these th this is a legitimate issue for us to explore. Um, I, I think it obviously that question will have an effect on the curricular model that an individual school takes forward. It may affect the degree to which um, individual schools pursue a broad general education up to the conclusion of S3, yeah. um, or whether they conclude that earlier and move into the uh, articulation into the senior phase. Um, but obviously, within that judgment, there is young people have an entitlement they have an entitlement to a broad general education up to the end of S3. And we have to be satisfied that in whatever curricular model, and this is an issue that will be tested by Education Scotland and inspections, as to whether there is a curricular model that is delivering that entitlement to young people of a broad general education uh, up to that stage. Uh, because that's a fundamental component of curriculum for excellence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for your attendance at the committee this morning and to your officials. I'm minded to suspend until 5 to 12, but remind members that they are coming back into public session.
Thank you. Um, can we resume with agenda item three, which is public petition PE1692 by Leslie Scott on behalf of Times Trust and Alison Pruce on behalf of Scotland Home Education Forum. The petition calls for inquiry into human rights impact of GERFEC policy and data processing. Paper four in the meeting papers outlines the history of the petition and the committee had agreed to wait for the outcome of the work of GERFEC practice development panel before giving the petition this second consideration. There are several options for further action listed in paper four. Um, can I ask members for their views? Um, if no other member um, wants to contribute to this, um, I'm conscious that the committee made a decision not to return to the petition until um, the outcome of the named person um, legislation. That having fallen, um, we are still awaiting um, the guidance from the Scottish Government and I think it would be possibly helpful to wait until that guidance is available before revisiting the petition. Um, but I suggest that we write to the Scottish Government for an update and progress on those. Um, Ms Smith. Thank you, Convener. I, I think there is a very specific issue here, which is about the named person aspect, rather than anything on a more broader uh, principle behind uh, the GERFEC policy. Uh, and that is specific to the uh, guidance that has been issued to local authorities and to other public bodies about uh, well, what was the implementation of the named person policy. And obviously, key sections have now been withdrawn. And so I think it would be uh, right and proper to wait for the government to come back, um, because it is uh, absolutely essential that that guidance is reviewed. Um, and I think the main principle of what the petitioners are asking for is very much in line with that. OK. Any further comments from members? Well, I agree. Yeah, I think, I think we should wait to get that, that back. Thank you. Um, if we move to uh, agenda item four, which is arrangements. Details of the instrument are in paper five. Do the members have any co comments on this instrument? No, no comments. Thank you. Um, just before we conclude the public session this week, I would like to put on record um, the committee's thanks to Dougie Wons, who's um, our senior clerk to the committee. Dougie is taking up a new position within the Scottish Government and moving on from the clerking team. I'm sure we'd all want to wish him well in his new role and thank him for his service both to this committee and other committees of the Parliament. And we now um, close public session. Thank you.